Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Criminally Underrated Movies. This time my choice is the 1985 comedy Heaven Help Us, also known by its more catchy and memorable title, The Catholic Boys. And therein lies a problem with the film's marketing. This may have contributed to its commercial failure and has certainly ensured that the film is largely forgotten today. How many people would see this movie title, Heaven Help Us, and think, oh yeah, this is going to be a barrel of laughs? It sounds like a story set in an elderly care home, and if that was the aim, then why not just call it On Golden Pond? Catholic Boys was the much better title because it encapsulates, first of all, the fact that this film is aimed at a young audience, and second of all, that it's set in a Catholic school. So you've got the conflict between teenagers and Catholic restriction in that title. This is a marvellous movie that I hardly hear anyone talk about these days. Um, like I said, it wasn't a commercial hit on cinemas when it was released. Though I do recall that a lot of my friends and family loved this film when it made its way into VHS rental stores back in the mid-80s. So the film was released in 1985 when teen comedies were very popular and arguably at their best. Porky's was a mega hit in 1982. Risky Business came out in 1983, and for me is probably the best teen movie of all time. 1984, there was Bachelor Party and Revenge of the Nerds. And in the same year as The Catholic Boys, there was The Breakfast Club, Team Wolf and Weird Science. And in the years following, there was Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Heathers, amongst many others. A lot of people say these 80s comedies are offensive, but middle finger to those people because politically correct comedy is boring as hell. Having said that though, Catholic Boys has a level of intelligence and sophistication that puts it more in line with risky business than the likes of Porky's and Bachelor Party. It has deeper themes that I'll get into later, but first of all, the basic plot. Set in the 1960s, but made in the 1980s, Catholic Boys is the story of a teenager, Michael Dunn, who is the new kid in class at a strict Catholic school in Brooklyn, New York. The school is run by disciplinary and often violent men of the cloth. Dunn lives with his grandparents and his younger sister. His grandmother is determined that he is going to be a priest when he's older, and she seems disinterested in whether Michael wants this for himself. He also acts as a sort of substitute father to his sister, who doesn't relate very well to their grandparents either. In school, Michael, or Dunn as the other kids call him, is caught between becoming friends with an intelligent but snobbishly suppressed fat kid named Caesar, and becoming friends with the more antisocial kids who aren't very bright, but are more confident and street smart, and, well, you know, they have more fun and they live a bit of a life where they get out and do things. So, Dunn has a number of dilemmas in his life. Should he hang out with the regular guys, or be a stiff, repressed intellectual with his friend Caesar? Should he aim to be a priest, or should he go off and do something more appealing with his life? The allure of a life without archaic religious constraint is represented mostly by his love interest, an independent-minded teenage girl named Danny, who works in a local store. Danny isn't religious and frankly has no time for religion, but she's responsible and wise beyond her years, and she's kind of cute, of course. So basically, the movie is about Dunn and his life decision dilemmas both in and out of the Catholic school environment. To that effect, it's a fairly serious drama. But it doubles up as a teen comedy, with most of the comedy be involving other characters besides the central character. He's not the one who cracks the jokes, other people do. He's not the butt of the jokes, other people are. There's lots of sexual jokes and teen rebellion shenanigans. Now, you may remember the movie Porky's had both hilarious scenes and intense drama scenes about racism and bad parenting. Porky's pulled off its comedy and its drama surprisingly well, with the excellent cast being essential. And the Catholic Boys manages to achieve a similar feat of being hilarious and intensely dramatic with good acting, but overall it's a more mature film than Porky's. The comedy set pieces aren't as wildly over the top as the ones in Porky's, such as the hooker for hire scene or the horny girl in the guy's locker room scene. Those were absolute bellyache scenes. The Catholic Boys doesn't really achieve those levels of laughs, but it's still got plenty to giggle at. Instead, where the film succeeds, and in my opinion surpasses Porky's by a long shot, is in its social themes and drama. Porky's went over the top in its depiction of rednecks being the most vile scum on the face of the earth, men with absolutely no redeeming features who physically look like fat pigs and dirty rodents, yet the film contradicted itself in how it presented women as sex objects. Now that stuff doesn't actually bother me. I don't sit there watching a movie like Porky's and with a frown on my face saying, oh, this is so inappropriate. 
because un-PC entertainment is a lot funnier than conformist PC garbage. So I still enjoy Porky's, but I take its contradictory social messages with a pinch of salt. However, in recent viewings of The Catholic Boys, I was really impressed with how the film has aged so well in terms of its drama and social messages. It would have been easy for this film to simply depict all Catholic school teachers as barbarian control freaks in denial of their own mortality and who try to pass off their own will as the will of God, or the film could have passed them all off as closet homosexuals or pedophiles. Not that the two are equated with each other these days, but back in the 80s films would get away with that kind of comparison. Instead of all that separating of characters into black and white, good and bad, this film presents multiple priest characters with different attitudes to life, attitudes to their faith, and attitudes to the kids they teach. Brother Constance is, almost in every scene, presented as a wicked and violent man, but his character is contrasted by Brother Timothy, who, like the lead character Dunn, the teenager, Brother Timothy has been transferred into the school on the same day. The Timothy is a much cooler guy, the kids like him, and he doesn't try to bully and control them. These two newcomers at the school, a kid and a teacher, are faced with the same dilemma of whether to conform to the culture of hypocrisy and violence, or whether to challenge it. It's a very good story set up, and without giving away any of the third act, the story plays out extremely well right to the end. Alright, so there's the basic plot outline. Now, before I talk about the contents of the film in more depth, I want to talk a bit more about the context, because it's a strange one. The script was written by a guy who you've likely never heard of, and his name was Charles Papora. According to Internet Movie Database, he has just three writing credits and nothing else related. Apparently he's dead today, so I can't even get in touch with him to ask about the script. Catholic Boys was his very first feature script, or at least the first one that got made, but the movie comes off like it's been written by a seasoned veteran. It's the solid backbone to the movie, and I, I really wish that this guy had done some more scripts, because I, uh, I think he had some real talent. However, since I haven't been able to find a copy of the script, I don't know whether a great deal of rewriting was done during the shoot to streamline the finished movie. I'd love to read his original script. But the script isn't the only way the movie excels. The movie was directed by someone else who you've likely never heard of, a director named Michael Dinner. His direction is extremely efficient, neither flashy nor boring, just effective. It draws us in, as it's supposed to. And yet, like the screenwriter, this was Michael Dinner's first outing as a director on a feature film. After this, he directed two more feature movies, but they weren't ones that left any kind of imprint on the public mind. And then he spent the rest of his career successfully producing and directing for TV. So I'm pretty baffled as to how a first-time screenwriter and a first-time director came up with a movie as confidently good as The Catholic Boys. Even the producers of the film weren't particularly experienced. No doubt the experienced editor Stephen A. Rotter played his part in streamlining the final cut, but an editor isn't responsible for the kinds of solid acting performances found in this movie. Cinematographer Miroslav Ondrikech, that's another one where I'm not sure how to pronounce it, he does an efficient job with the visuals, which is sometimes passed off as the talents of the director. Miroslav had about 10 movies to his credit already, so he knew what he was doing. Overall, it's hard to pinpoint a single visionary talent behind this movie, and maybe there isn't one. Maybe the core crew chemistry was a lucky mix. However, an area of talent that is clearly defined in the film is the acting. All the major players do a sterling job in their roles, they're all believable, except for one very symbolic character, and I'll talk about him later. And no doubt whoever chose the cast knew what they were doing, but no one seems to be credited for that. Andrew McCarthy is perfectly good as the introspective but quietly confident new kid in school who's patiently trying to get the lay of the land. He's an interesting actor. He's got this kind of gentle soul kind of vibe about him. Not quite a fashion model, but not a geek either. Good old reliable Donald Sutherland is excellent as the school headmaster. Stephen Jeffries has an odd role as a kid whose obsession with sex borders on mental illness, and later that same year he had a memorable part in Fright Night. Maybe his role in the Catholic Boys got him the job in Fright Night, I don't know. His character is the really weird symbolic one who I'll, I said I'll talk about later, so we'll leave that for now. But there are two standout performances that for me give this movie a big boost in terms of comedy, 
Kevin Dillon is hilarious as the thick-headed but sort of street-smart kid who befriends Michael against his will. A lot of the funniest scenes are his scenes. Now, I am a big fan of Matt Dillon, especially for his role in Rumblefish, but Kevin Dillon had a great screen presence of his own. He's less of a fashion model in the looks department, but he really knows how to play an anti-social type with a hint of psychopath, and he knows how to deliver funny dialogue. This was Kevin's first feature film role, and the following year, Oliver Stone gave him an insanely dark but equally hilarious role in Platoon, and he shined in that film as well. Kevin Dillon was a very underrated actor. In my view, he was just as talented as his brother. Now, the other standout role for me in Catholic Boys is another newcomer, an actor named Jay Patterson. He only had one movie role to his credit at the time, but he is menacing and believable as the violent and depressive brother Constance. His scenes, I think, are the most powerful in the movie in terms of drama. Mr. Dunn, there's something you should know about me. I'm not a man who enjoys violence. In fact, I find I get much better results when I use patience. And this, Mr. Dunn, is patience. You, and you, and you, and you, and you. Let's go. What is this? It's quite all right, brother. Everything's under control. Bastard! All right, so we've explored the basic plot and the, the, the crew and the cast. The Catholic Boys did actually get some decent reviews when it came out. Not all decent, but there were some positives. Uh, and there was, certainly there were films that were very successful that got much worse reviews than this one. And the movie has had some positive retrospective reviews since, but it's still a largely forgotten movie that most people have never seen or heard of. It certainly had its fair share of undeserved negative reviews, though. The idiots of Rotten Tomatoes, with their massive positive bias towards new releases, which I always find very suspicious have given this 1985 film a 40% rating. Idiots. Metacritic, 64%. Still too low. And Internet Movie Database, a more favourable 7 out of 10. That's not bad. Personally, I'd give the movie at least 8 out of 10. And quite plausibly, I'd give it 9 out of 10. It's, it's very, very good, and I consider it to be a full-on classic. I've already outlined some of the positives in terms of plot structure, character dynamics, good acting, and the fact that the film doesn't put all of its characters in black and white boxes, but there's plenty more. At 1 hour and 44 minutes, the film is very efficient in pacing. It doesn't waste the viewer's time because each scene gets straight to the point and doesn't overstay its welcome, thanks in part to sharp editing. Cinematography and lighting is perfectly good throughout. It has a similar look to movies like, say, The Godfather or The Untouchables. It really captures a convincing portrait of its time. Nothing to complain about there. Dialogue is naturalistic and believable. James Horner creates a thematically suitable Irish Catholic score. You may recall his more famous action scene scores like 48 Hours and Aliens. Well, his score here is very, very different and absolutely suits. So overall, it's a very efficient film on the technical and aesthetic level. But let's explore more of its psychological depth. Now, as I did with my last criminally underrated episodes on Star Trek The Motion Picture and Psycho 2, I will at this point be giving some spoilers about the ending of the film. So here's your opportunity to stop this video, go get a copy of the movie, watch it, and then come back and view the rest of this analysis. I recommend you take the time out to do that. It's a really good movie, which you'll enjoy a lot more without spoilers. Okay, you've had your warning there, so let's get on with the deeper themes and aesthetics. Well, first of all, I like very much that the film doesn't buy into any particular institutions or ideologies, and yet at the same time it presents both the pros and cons of the things that it seems to rebel against. Like I said previously, the teachers in this Catholic school are quite varied in their attitude to life, and so are the pupils themselves, and that's realistic. The movie ends with a metaphor of religious institution reform, Brother Constance is transferred out and told he'll never work with kids again, and in comes Brother Timothy to take his place. Obviously, he'll teach a much more tolerant version of the faith. As is often said, but so often forgotten, there's good and bad in all walks of life. Through the character of Caesar, the nerd student who wants to go to Harvard and then become a psychiatrist, the fields of science and academia are suitably shown up as being racked with denial, repression, and self-glorifying ego, just as religious institutions are. And this is arguably true. I've met lots of academics, and some of them I find are less likable or relatable than even priests are, even though I'm not religious. 
The men of the cloth hide behind a web of biblical sermons and ritualized public displays. And guess what? So do academics. The common sin of plagiarism in academia is brought to the forefront in this movie as well. Father, I failed to footnote some of my sources. Get to the sin, please. Plagiarism, Father. Alone or with someone else? With a girl? Father, if this is discovered, it could someday keep me out of Harvard. In fact, to a, to a sort of extent, plagiarism is kind of built into academia in that whenever somebody publishes a paper, they're constantly referencing other academics who've gone before them as if to say, oh, look, somebody else who's an academic agrees with this, therefore it's on good standing. I much prefer it when people present their own logic instead of trying to base things on what other people have said. While priests egotistically think of themselves as people who God speaks through, Caesar believes that he was born to be part of the academic elite. Father, if this is discovered, it could someday keep me out of Harvard. And Father, I was conceived to go to Harvard. A minus, brother. I found your assertion that Charles Dickens was a paranoid schizophrenic. Slightly hard to swallow. Caesar's own preoccupation with Freudian interpretations of other people's behavior is marked in that he has two scenes in which he is embarrassed by the act of defecation of all things. Here he has no choice but to use his own academic writing as toilet paper. Perhaps that's a metaphor about the fact that what he's writing is actually ridiculous. And the mere embarrassment of defecation is present here. Caesar, hey! What are you doing, Rooney? Tonight's the night, buddy. Freud would have a lot to say about that stuff. So it's good that this movie is warning its viewers not to fall too deeply into either of these institutional fakery traps, religion or academia. And the film even taps into something very interesting about Freud that's still true today. A lot of academics have rejected Freud's theories, and while he wasn't necessarily right about everything, of course, the uncomfortable aspects of human sexuality that Freud wasn't afraid to identify are almost certainly part of why some oppose his theories. In other words, Freud raised sexual psychology issues that some of his academic contemporaries feel uncomfortable with, and so they reject those ideas on the basis of bias. Caesar himself is kind of guilty of this, and here his denial is mocked by the situation itself. I thought it was well written, entertaining, and extremely enlightening. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> yes, and I especially like the way you detailed the split between Freud and Jung. Well, you see, Freud was sort of an asshole. I, I... Well, I mean, to reduce everything that is longer than it is wide to a penis is an... <laughs> On to the subject of love. The love interest between Michael and Danny seems to be centered around the fact that both of them want out of institutional shackles. He wants out of religion, hence at the end of the film he virtually requests to be expelled from school. It's my fault, brother. I'm the one who should be expelled. And when he's at the school dance, where there's tons of girls from an all-girls religious school to pick from, he leaves so he can go off and spend time with the non-Catholic girl that he actually wants. Even her open defiance of the concept of God as a cruel entity doesn't put him off. How's that for a kick in the head? Danny refuses to go to school at all, not even a regular high school. But she's not stupid. She runs a business on behalf of her father who has given up on life. She's smart, she's wise, and she says she learns a lot more from books at home anyway. I know that's not for everyone, but I can certainly relate to that. In particular, the film shows that sexual repression is a feature of brainwashed priests and of the academically overindulgent. I've already given one example of that. The presence of all-male and all-female schools is an unhealthy form of sexual separation imposed by the system. This little speech gets to the heart of the sexual repression matter, in that the moment of orgasm is a moment when people lose their facade of self-control and they give themselves over to their emotions and their physical senses. Never confuse love with the deadliest of the seven deadly sins. Lust, 
eternal fires of hell, even the most advanced souls. Lust is the beast within you, where for all eternity your flesh will be ripped from your body by grotesque serpents with razor sharp teeth. There are a few moments of weakness that led you to admire the shape of somebody's buttocks. Have a nice time. Enjoy the dance. It's the intense release of uncontrolled emotion that the sexually repressed object to. But Caesar the academic nerd shares the church's fear of repressed emotional release. So how come you guys aren't dancing? Caesar doesn't dance. Even Rooney, the dunce, knows this and constantly insults Caesar about it. Hey Caesar, you fat faggot. You always wear gum on your nose? Caesar doesn't work with morons. No, hey, don't forget it. I don't need any help, especially from a faggot like him. So what do you say, huh? You gonna help me or what? Come on, please. Hey, you can still be a faggot as far as I'm concerned. Let me tell you something about Rooney. He's just projecting his doubts about his own sexuality. Rooney makes a lot of these homophobic jokes, even toward the teachers. Oh, sure. Go tell Constance I'm sorry. Call him a goddamn faggot. He'll cream my face. Don't worry, those faggots are never going to know we're missing. Oh, sure, you're going to reason with a grown man in a dress? But, you know, this was the 1980s, and mockery of homosexuals was very common in movies back then. But every era has its forms of unchallenged bigotry. Not that this movie inspired anyone to go out and do something bad to a homosexual person anyway. Even today's virtue signalers are in denial of their own forms of intense bigotry. Point it out to them and watch them either explode with self-discrediting rage or they'll fall silent then quickly change the subject. But hey, the Catholic Boys also throws in a little moment regarding racial issues in the 1960s. The movie's only black character is present here and he's on friendly terms with Danny who is the non-Catholic girl who's outside the system. There's no black kids in the school. The time period the movie is set in, the 1960s, was an era of liberation from sexual repression, and so the film's sexual themes go beyond religion and academia. Lead character Dunn, he gets it on with a girl who isn't part of any institution. It's tastefully done through the metaphors of dancing and literally getting wet. Hey, listen, um, I'm glad I got to dance with you. But again, the film strikes a mature balance. Dunn actually is falling in love with this girl. But Rooney tries to get it on with another cutie out of no other motive than raw lust. Despite the idiotic burn in hell for your lust ramblings of this guy at the school dance, Rooney is seemingly punished by God not just for his lust but also for trying to use his dad's expensive car to impress women. Here, take some more. (laughs) Oh God! Thank you, God. Thank you. I'll never forget you for this guy. Oh, my God! Oh, Rudy! Stop, guy! What are you doing? You're fucking me up here, guy! That's quite funny because it contradicts the film's opposition to the sexual oppression imposed by religious institutions. It's saying, yeah, free yourself sexually, but don't become a shallow idiot in doing so, or there will be consequences. And that's true in life. The strangest character in the movie is Williams. Undoubtedly he is a symbolic character and not meant to be taken as a literal representation of a standard teenager. He says very little, but he masturbates a lot. And he has hair permanently stood on end like he's in a state of permanent orgasm. Jesus, you got here, you jerked off 168 times? It's been one month since your last confession? It's an average of, uh... 5.6 times a day. Oh my god, you can't tell him that. He'll cut your balls off. I think his character basically just represents uncontrolled lust in terms of how the church sees it. He takes sexual arousal from seeing girls at communion. If that's not blasphemy, I don't know what is. And he even has the facial features of being like a little devil. He seems to be a caricature of what the church thinks of uh, lust. There's also a shot mixed in with this arousal sequence that shows the figure of Christ with another figure physically embracing it. What the hell is this scene saying? It 
In the ending narration, Williams' destiny seems to sum up what he represents. Williams got a job as a projectionist at the Peekaboo Theatre in Times Square. And actually the same goes for Rooney. He's the one who's narrating here. He was preoccupied with using flash cars and hence money to attract women, and he sleezes after women in the process. But in the end it's revealed that his quieter friend Corbett ends up marrying Janine, the girl who Rooney was trying to get drunk and take advantage of here. But Rooney's own desire to impress women with money remains forever thwarted by God. I went to petition school where everybody graduated, except me. But I got a job as a shampoo boy at Marissa's House of Hair in Bensonhurst. The hours suck, the pace sucks, I'm surrounded by funny guys, but the tips are great. Thank you, guy. In turn, this leads to another of the film's fascinating dynamics. The movie isn't saying that there is or isn't a god. The punishment for Rooney of his lust suggests that there is, and the ending narration which suggests that Michael and Danny, against massive odds, managed to accidentally find each other again years later. This suggests that God was on the side of these lovers, even though it suggested that they had sex out of wedlock. They certainly seemed like they were about to, and this place was private enough. Tying in with this, there's a moment just before where Michael tells her to make a wish while throwing a stone into the sea. At the end of the shot, she runs back and throws the stone. What did she wish for, and was it granted? I'll bet it was something to do with being happily together with Michael. If God did bring them back together and fulfil her wish years later, as part of the 60s musical cultural change, then it's also God giving a fuck you to the priests of the school who had Danny's store closed down in the first place, resulting in she and Michael being separated from each other. In other words, there might be a God, but whose impact on our lives isn't determined by the black and white rules that are penned out by humans in their institutional religious texts. This is really good stuff, I like the philosophy of this movie. That also appears to be extended to the issue of nature versus institutional monuments. Michael's friends behead a revered statue in the school grounds as revenge on Michael's behalf because of the school getting the shop shut down where Michael's girlfriend lived. The attack on the statue could be taken as an insult to God, but it's actually an insult to the archaic school bureaucracy instead. Very much of interest is that the birds have been crapping all over this statue no matter how many times it gets cleaned. These birds are God's own natural creations and they're defiling an institutional symbol. And even the headmaster is onto this. They assaulted the faculty, they have disgraced this institution, and they destroyed a statue of St. Basil. Hated that statue. In another example of this balancing act, the absurdity of going to confession is shown. And what'd you steal? He's gonna wanna know. And he's gonna tell you to bring it all back. Here, change this 22 to 2 and tell him it was some food or something. What if he wants me to bring that back? What? The crap? I mean, really, how many people? go to confession and actually open up about all of the impure thoughts they've had and all the rest of it and all the different ways that they've sinned. I'll bet that hardly any do. For the least fact that most of our sins are committed subconsciously, we don't even realize it. And I'm using the word sins, you know, in the sort of religious description. I don't necessarily consider all those things to be sins. And yet confession seems to be taken seriously here by Dunn showing that he actually hasn't given up on God, and that maybe there can be some value in confession. There's an odd little moment too where Dunn and Brother Timothy are making their own little private prayers. We don't know what each of them are praying for, maybe they're praying for the school to be better, I don't know. But we cut straight to them having a one-to-one -one chat outside about the philosophical ins and outs of life. Timothy even points out that he and his brother were conditioned and expected to take certain routes in life, but they surprised each other by growing up to take the opposite social roles to what was expected. Again, this movie likes to challenge the limitations of institutional moulding. You know the way a lot of movies pretentiously pose as being all virtuous by being staunchly against something? Look, our movie is anti-racist and or anti-establishment, therefore you should wholeheartedly agree with it and shout yeah for our cause. Well, this movie is much wiser. It's not saying close down the churches and the schools and free the kids from oppression and everyone will live happily ever after. It's saying, let's recognise and keep the positives of these institutions, 
but loosen the shackles enough for us to have a bit of personal freedom and thus a life worth living. Reform is generally better than destruction. The character of Dunn is very good in himself in that, unlike most teenagers who assume to know more than they actually do, he spends a lot of time observing, listening, taking it all in rather than shouting that he knows it all. But nor does he have a superiority complex. He befriends the regular guys, the nerds and even one of the priests. He's open to different types of people and he doesn't try to impose his values upon them or tell them how to live their lives. At the same time, he's not a pushover. Rooney tries to bully him, but instead of just reacting there and then, he turns on him later. He's absolutely pissed with controlling institutions when his girlfriend is taken away, smacking a passing school bus as it drives by. Now that may seem like nothing, but think about it. The filmmakers took the time to get an old school bus into this shop for that very reason. I think it's a visual metaphor about his frustration with the school systems. Despite his anger, he doesn't just react, he waits, eventually only snapping when Brother Constance steps way over the line. Impudent piece of trash. Sometimes the quiet ones are the ones you shouldn't mess with. In fact, he and Danny share these quiet until you fuck with me traits. And it makes sense that she likes him. Instead of talking garbage, he communicates mainly through actions, like silently helping her clean up the shop after it's been trashed. And when she gets angry at him and chucks him out for walking into the shop unannounced, she feels a bit guilty and invites him back in. But instead of just desperately saying yes and barging in like most lads would, he just stands there and says he's gonna go home. You wanna come in? Nah, I'm gonna head home. Please. Wisely, he was making sure that she really wanted him to come in. Smart girls appreciate those kinds of gestures. So these are very well-written characters. Interesting as well is the fact that both of these characters lack efficient parents. Danny tells a sob story that her father fell in love with a woman he was having an affair with, but he couldn't bring himself to leave his wife. So the other woman killed herself, and then when he couldn't get over that, his wife left him. So he lost both women. On the one hand, I think that story is perhaps an indication to Michael about the importance of actually doing what you love or being with who you love, instead of going through the motions of conforming to keep up appearances. But at the same time, Danny's father needs to get his shit together instead of spending the rest of his life sulking about it. You've got a lovely teenage daughter running your business here, you idiot. Get on your feet and get on with your life. At the very least, be a good example to your kid. Also on the issue of love that wasn't fulfilled or was unrequited, whatever you want to call it, there's a little suggestion that the school headmaster had a relationship with one of the nuns, or at least he wanted to. Sister St. Luke and I go back a long way. You know Sister St. Luke, Mr. Dunn? Yes. How is Sister St. Luke, Mr. Dunn? She's dead. Brother Thaddeus. You may go, Mr. Dunn. Back to the story of Danny's father and him losing two women he loved and then becoming a self-pitying waste of a man. This is a weird aspect of the movie because Michael's parents are completely absent from his life and he effectively raises his sister just as Danny looks after her dad. We don't even get to find out what happened to Michael's parents. Did they die in a car crash? Was he born out of wedlock and dad ran away and mother couldn't look after him? Whatever the reason, Michael and his sister are faced with the same dilemma as Danny, inefficient or absent parents, of which his grandparents are a poor substitute. His grandmother appears to dominate the household, and his granddad isn't much more involved in things than Danny's father is. The film's efficiently at communicating these character traits and relationships quickly and simply is shown here in that grandmother won't let Michael's sister play with the flowers at the dinner table, 
and she mostly ignores what her husband says. Maybe the point of all this is that both Michael and Danny are self-reliant, independent-minded characters specifically because they don't have someone stronger than them to lean on. Contrasting with this, Rooney's dad apparently has lots of money, hence the expensive car he borrows, and yet Rooney is an idiot. Right, I'll stop there. So there you have it. The Catholic Boys is a criminally underrated and criminally underseen film. I've read some positive retrospective reviews, but found that hardly anyone has identified the finer nuances of the film or its wisely balanced exploration of multiple overlapping social and psychological issues. Even if you've seen the spoilers here, go and get a copy of the movie. It's really, really good. If you did see the movie back in the day and you haven't seen it for many years since, I highly recommend you go back to it. I was very surprised at how the film has lasted, how it stood the test of time. Thanks for watching. You've been listening to Rob Eger. If you want to see lots more videos like this, then make sure to subscribe and support me on Patreon or go and check out my digital downloads on my website. Amen.